what it is, and so we are afraid of it. But like I was mentioning to, to you earlier in the parable that we have seen, in a sense, although yes, it is worrisome, if you are with a wedding garment, if you have put Christ's righteousness, the judgment is a blessing. And tonight, by the grace of God, we'll see that. But let's continue on because it's something that you, the Spirit Prophecy tells us that we should investigate and we should be able to give a good answer. A, a, we should be able to give a reason of the hope that is in them. We should give a reason of the hope, not of the gloom, of the, of the, of the worry, but of the hope that is in them. The intercession of Christ in men's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was what? His death upon the cross. So the intercession is as essential as his sacrifice. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven to, to complete in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil whither the forerunner for us entered. Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, no one knows how soon, it will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. And this time, at this time, above, above all others, it behooves, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So, it is, well, oh, I th let me finish here first. It is important to understand that, yes, it is a solemn work. We are to watch and pray. We have to understand that that work in the heavenly sanctuary is of the utmost importance to us. And our cases, and we know, and as I mentioned here in this prophecy, the cases, the, the investigative judgment started, what year started? You all know that, 1844. And she mentions when she wrote this in inspiration that soon, you, nobody knows how soon, the cases of the living will come before God. So <clears throat> we're going to finish with this quote, and we're going to go to two um, concepts that I believe are misconceptions of the judgment. But notice what it says. This is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. It is while men are still dwelling upon the earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. The lives of all his professed followers pass in review before God. All are examined according to the record of the books of heaven and according to his deeds, the destiny of each is forever fixed. So I know this is something you have heard, or most of you have heard. This is not new. And we have seen, and we saw in, in, in the parable, which is a parable about the investigative judgment, that it is to, to happen here on earth. It is something that it happens while Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary interceding for us. But there are two misconceptions that I believe have penetrated in our minds in regards to the investigative judgment. And some of these misconceptions are, are found or are, have been added in our mind, in our finite mind, based on how we as humans understand the judgment works and not based on how the Bible presents itself. Sometimes we add, and we have to be very careful not to add information that has not been given in the Word of God. We have to be very careful not to add anything that has not been said. Sometimes silence in the Word of God is our best security, our, face, our, 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 our safest bet. So the first misconception that when we think of the investigative judgment, and we specifically we think of and we're, we're afraid of the, la the judgment of the living, is that we sort of think that each name comes up in some sort of sequence. In other words, you feel, and, and, and again, this is something that I've heard and I've seen and I've even been preached about in a way where the judgment somehow goes in a list name by name. So for example, I am before the Lord, he's examining the cases of everyone. Let's say that 
somehow we're still wearing the judgment of the living, and my name comes up, God sees my life, sees my deeds, sees what I have done, and because he can see the future, my life, uh, he says, well, you know, somehow he's not going to make it, or he will make it. And either way, my name comes up, the decision is made, and then God moves to the next name. So one of the first misconceptions that is nowhere found in the Bible, there's nowhere in the spirit prophecy this conception, conception or this misconception, is that each individual investigation is in sequence. Okay? There is, of course, a sequence of, it starts with the death, all that have died, and then goes into the living. That is the only sequence we know. But we don't have any evidence that it is made in an individual case-by-case case, uh, you know, setting. And it is important to keep this in mind because this, this misconception can give you a false sense of what the judgment works or how it goes. Then the second misconception that kind of implies or connects to this conception is this. The judgment of each individual ends when its name has been seen, has been gone through, not when probation closes. So basically, because we think it's in sequence, the second thought is, well, if my name came up, I am already doomed. Or, or blessed, it doesn't matter, but we are afraid. So these two misconceptions of the judgment have created an open door to speculation to have the concepts and ideas thrown out there that perhaps we need a certain uh, pinpoint in time to realize when that will happen. But the Word of God, no word mentions that it works this way. And we will see, in a, in a, in a, perhaps in a, like I was mentioning, in, in, in the way that the Lord works, or how He shows in the Word of God, how I believe how the Bible presents itself this concept of judgment. Now, is the judgment, is the concept of judgment, let me ask you this question, is the concept of judgment only found in Daniel, in the, in the prophecy of Daniel and Revelation? No, it's found throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, there is a book in the Bible that if you want to know what goes behind the scenes or how I believe the Lord granted us a view of how the judgment in heaven works. It's actually a book found in the Old Testament, and it's the book of Job. Job, chapter 1. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 1. We need to see how the Bible presents the concept of judgment, so that we, again, when we come to the investigative judgment, we can understand how the Lord operates, how the Lord explains to us how things take place. In the book of Job, and you probably have seen uh, this book uh, many times and have read it and you probably know the story, but we're going to try to briefly go and see what happens. Verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who else came among them? Satan came also among them. Now, of course, we understand that this is uh, before Christ came to this earth, this was something that happened in heaven, and Satan came, and then, you know, the, the, the sons of God is mentioned, they present themselves before the Lord. But prophetically speaking, this symbolism is very, very profound because, in a sense, it's setting you already the idea that in the investigative judgment, the sons of God, those that were called to be sons of God, we already went through that this morning, so, you, you know, those, I'm not going to go through those verses that connect that, but the sons of God come before God. But he, who else is among them? Who else is there to come before God when God is putting uh, someone in the investigation? Satan, the accuser of the brethren. And so Satan was also came among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, notice this language is, is very important. Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered and the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So here, God asks Satan, where are you coming from? So he says, I've been coming, going around the earth, going back and forth. So, cry, God, verse 8, 
says the following. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and skeweth evil? What type of language is this? What type of words is God mentioning here? This is God telling Satan that he has seen the life of Job, he has looked at his, this man, and he has investigated his life to the point that he can say, look, have you not considered I have someone whose life is right, who in my books, in my judgment, in my investigation of his life, I find him without guile. I find him that is perfect and upright, that he stays away from evil. He is skewed with evil. So now, briefly, and you know the story, but think about this. Is God telling this information or, or passing this sentence to, about Job to Satan? He's letting him know about Job. Is that something that happens at one moment and is the same thing? I mean, it ends there? It's, a, it, it, it's, it's a somehow that God has seen the life and already can say, I, I, I'm sure that you know, he, um, he will be perfect from here on earth, I mean, from, from henceforward. I, I'm sure that, that Job will not fail me. I'm sure that uh, I have, I can assure you that he's not gonna fail me. Now, if that was the case, if was, that was the case, Satan wouldn't bother by saying the following thing. What about Satan said? Well, has now thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath in every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to the, thy face. So Satan is telling him, if, if, if it was that God already sealed this man, and there was no way for him to change or to denounce God, Satan would have said, wait, this, this judgment, this, this thing is, is unfair, you know? You already have sealed him, there's nothing I can do to help him change. But Satan said, no, no, all right. It's because you have protected him so much. So you know what? Let him have, let me have him, let me destroy what he has, and you'll see that he changes his heart. And God, guess what? What does God say? What does the Lord do to this proposition of Satan? Verse 10, 12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he had is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So said, the Lord agreed. said, okay, touch him. Let's put the man to trial. Let's, let's, let's see if, 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 if my investigation over his life is, is wrong. So you know the story, verse 13 and forward, we see that there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest, eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding the, beside them. And the sa Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yeah, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped along to tell thee. So here we start seeing that immediately after the Lord grants the request, to the enemy, to Satan, he starts acting upon it, destroying his servants, taking what he had. Then verse 16 says, And he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is falling from heaven and had burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So then again, more calamities, more tribulations, more destruction in his home. And while yet he was speaking, verse 17, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yeah, and slay the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, imagine already everything that he has done, all his merchants, all his possessions, all his businesses are crumbled, are destroyed, are taken away from him. This is all happening. 
And when he was speaking, the last, I guess, uh, calamity or the worst of them, because he dealt with his sons, happened. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. When we see this situation happening before Job, Satan expected him to do what? Quit. He said, you know what? I'm not, I'm going to go and, and curse God. This is impossible. Imagine all that I've had, all my family, my businesses, my homes, my, uh, my labors, all the things that I did with, you know, dedication. And Job did it honestly. He did not, you know, amass riches by acting deceitfulness, in deceitfulness. He actually did right. He was a right man, a righteous man, and blessed by God. But everything that he had, all of his possessions, his own children were taken from him in that day. Yet, verse 20 says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and what? And worshipped. In the middle of all this tribulation and this, 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 this terrible, terrible things that happened to him, he, yes, he showed he was grieved. He showed he was sad. He was heartbroken. But he worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed, what? Be the name of the Lord. So you see that as God has put this man on, in, in, as he had investigated the life of this man, God could see that this man was faithful, that loved the Lord, and God had the confidence that Job will be able to withstand those horrible tribulations and trials. So the next chapter, and we're not going to read because of time, but the next chapter, what happened? Well, I guess we have to read just a couple of verses just to make sure that we know what's happening here. Verse 1, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, notice the word here that starts this sentence again. In other words, again, it continues. It is happening a second time. It was not just at one moment, at one ex single incident, but it continues. And again, so they came. And the Lord said unto Satan the same question, where are you coming from? And then he says the same thing, you know, from, from going to and from the earth and from walking up and down in it. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil? Notice that he repeats the exact same things he said about Job before. So he sees that, in, again, in the, his investigation after the trial, after all that terrible consequences, in the, by God seeing his life, investigating his life, he sees that this man is still what? Righteous, perfect, that he is walking and fear the Lord. And, and says, and still beholdest fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So here God is saying, even after all that you made me do, or you, you allowed you to do, you know, I granted you permission to do, even after all of that, he still is righteous. And so Satan tells the same, okay, you know what? Uh, let, let, me, let me do something else. He will definitely change if you allow me to touch his life. Flesh, if I touch his flesh, then he will curse you and, and he no longer will be this righteous man. So what does God do? Does he allow Satan to touch his life? Did he allow it? Yes, he allowed it. He allowed his, Satan to put his hand on his, on his flesh, on his body, and immediately a horrible disease came upon him. Ulcers, uh, sores, boils. And he's, it says that from the top of his head 
to his feet. I mean, the, the, he was covered on them. And of course, we know the story, and, and he was going through this terrible ordeal to the point that even his wife, he, she just couldn't take it anymore. She said to him, what? Just curse God and die. I mean, imagine the, 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 the point of depression, anxiety. But even then, Job did not follow the counsel or the idea of his wife. He actually reproves her. Verse 10, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not receive evil? In all this did Job did not sin with his lips. So we see that Job, in spite of that second affliction, in spite of being granted by God to Satan to touch his life and bring him all this horrible disease, that his whole body was covered. I don't think, you have, I don't know if I, have, I don't think I ever seen someone suffer like Job has. Have you, have you seen someone like that? Have you seen someone that has lost his whole family, his children, all that he possesses, even you know, everything that he has cherished. And then he receives this type of disease that his own f wife cannot stand it anymore. And he's telling him, look, just die. I don't think I've ever seen one person like that. But this is a true story. This is not a fable, like some people want to uh, uh, say and, uh, or think. This is a true, actual event. Now, <coughs> God, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of these situations of Job, what is God doing? He still is looking upon Job. He still is investigating the love of Job. He still is seeing what and how Job reacts. So, as we open our minds to this concept, let's continue and briefly let's go to chapter 8 of Job and see what happens when his friends came over. You know his friends came, and they, for seven days, they just, could just, they, just, they just were crying. They couldn't just take it. I mean, imagine you met someone in the prime of his life. He was a rich man, blessed by God, a beautiful family, a beautiful home. He was a righteous man, a man that would pray to the Lord. Every day he will worship God. He will do sacrifices for his children. I mean, he, he loved his children so much that he will sacrifice in behalf of them, hoping that if they commit a sin, they can be, God, you know, he, his intercession will help them to be reproved and, 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 and repent from their sins. So these men, you have met a person like that, and, and all of a sudden you see completely destroyed. This man is completely destroyed physically, hourly. So they come, they cry, and uh, I, again, I do encourage you to read this whole uh, book. But at the very end of chapter 8, verses 20, Bildad, one of his friends, tells him something. He tells, he tells him, behold, this is the joy of his way. I'm sorry. Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers. You see, that was trying to tell Job that somehow this whole thing that came upon him is because he was a sinner, that he had done a lot of something terrible, something that deserved to be punished, and that he was a sinner. So Bildad is saying, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither shall others Neither, neither will he help the evildoers, till he fill thy mouth with laughing, laughing, and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the, that, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. So he's telling him, look, God does not reject the perfect person. He does not bless the evildoers. He will not help them. And if you are doing right in the sight of God, your, your mouth will be filled with laughing and your lips will be rejoicing. So Job, verse nine, chapter 9, verse 1, answers to that and says, I know it is so of a truth. So he says, I know what you're saying. It does make sense. It's true. God does not help the wicked. God does not reject the perfect man. And in the lips of the just there is rejoicing. 
There is praise. There's laughter. But, verse, continued verse, but how should men be what? Just with God. Job asked this question. How does a man be just with God? Job did not understand what was going on in heaven. Job did not understand that he was being put in an investigation, that he was taken by the Lord in a, and allowed by God to have Satan prove that this man was perfect and righteous and right. He didn't know, know that. So he's thinking, I don't know. How, how can a man be just with God? How, I, how do I know if, if, if I can be justified, if I am right before the Lord? Verse 3 says, if he, speaking of men, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. See, a person, a human being, cannot go to the God and says, well, you know, there's reasons why I am sinning. There's a reason why I am not able to be faithful to you. You see, my mother was of terrible character. She was a very, you know, harsh woman. So I also have that character, and I also am harsh, and that's why I cannot give up being harsh with my children and my family. Oh, my father was an alcoholic, so that is why I also am an alcoholic. Or my, my parents, or my family, or whatever you're going to say, you know, I was a raised by in the streets and therefore I need I cannot stop lying I cannot stop cheating I cannot stop stealing whatever it is is there an excuse before the Lord he says there's none a man cannot justify anything before God there's not a single sin that a man can say to God uh, this is something that you can help me with I mean there's absolutely the, this is the only thing that I, I couldn't change Job is making it very clear that before the judgment, there's no excuse. There's not a word that you can say to the Lord. Not one. Continue verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who had hardened himself against him and had prospered. Who he thinks, you know, that I know a lot, that I have information, that I am knowledgeable, and can say to the Lord, you know what? Let's deal. Let, let's, let's try to come to an arrangement. This is judgment language. You are coming before trial, and he's saying a man cannot come to God and to his judgment and say, I am strong, I have righteousness, I am right. Verse 5, which removed the mountains and they know not, which overturned them in his anger, which shaked the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. He's saying God is so much more greater, so much more powerful that there's nothing on earth that can stand the Lord, that can say to the Lord, don't touch. Which commanded the sun and it raised it not and sealed it up at the stars, which alone spread it out the heavens and treaded upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yeah, and wonders without number. So here Job is saying, there's no way we can stand before God. I cannot stand before him. I, I know that. I'm a human being. I cannot have anything before God that can say, I have some merit on my own. I have some sort of way to excuse my actions. I have some way to excuse my sin. There's nothing. And Job says, these. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him what? Not. He passeth also, passeth on also, but I what? I perceive him not. Job did not understand because inspiration took over when he was saying these words, but I don't think Job understood exactly to the content of what this meant. Because even though he did, did not see anything going right in his life. He did not see that, you know, that somehow he felt that perhaps God had rejected him. He felt that he was not able to stand. He made this exclamation, this promise, that even though I do not see God with my eyes, he's here. He goes by me. Even though I do not per perceive him, he passes by. Even though I don't feel him or I perceive that he's near, he is there. 
Now, how can we understand this if we are living in a time of judgment? How can this be for us even more clear, more um, uh, easy to understand? Let's go to the book of Luke. I'm sorry, book of John. Book of John. And I would like you to go to the book of John chapter 9. In the book of Job chapter 9, John, I'm sorry, thank you, thank you. John chapter 9, we have a story, another illustration of this experience, going through the investigative judgment in a way and feeling kind of like Job, but seeing how the Lord works in the midst of this. You know the story, um, but it's, it's such a blessing, it's such a beautiful story. Let's start with verses one. And Jesus passed by and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. What happened in this example? We see that Jesus is passing by. It was on a Sabbath. Most likely it was a Sabbath morning and he was going to a synagogue or to the temple. And as he was going by, he sees this man who is what? He's blind. But this is no ordinary blind man. Why is this man relevant in the story? What, was, what made him important? This man was blind from where? From, from birth. He had never seen. He had never seen. Now imagine living in a life of complete darkness all through your life. You had never seen anything but darkness. I mean, I praise the Lord that I don't have that experience. It must be very hard, very difficult. And this man, who was already grown, was by the wayside. And the disciples came by to the Lord and says, Lord, wait a minute. We see that there is this man here that is blind by birth. Let, 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 let me ask you this question. Was this man, I mean, blind because somehow his parents were the guilty ones, they were the sinful ones, or because he is a sinner and somehow God knew that and made him blind as a punishment. That's not the mentality. This is based, of course, in what they had heard the teachers of the law and the, the scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders, tell them. So Christ answers them, and notice the, the way that he answers. Jesus answered verse 3, Neither hath this man sin, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, if we were to end the words of Christ at that point, you could almost argue and think that he was going to say it's about his physical healing only. But notice that it is a plural word, works, and Christ continues explaining why this man was blind. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is also, if you have not before seen this, this is also very important contextually to the message that we're talking this evening. Because he's telling you something. While I am the light in the world, as long, I'm sorry, as long as I am, the, I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light. As long as Christ is interceding, there is grace. Now, continue with the story. When he has that spoken, he had his pad on the ground, and you know the story, he made clay, put it in his, in his, in his, um, 
in his eyes, anointed his eyes, the blind man, with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpretation sent. So he went his way thereof, this man, and washed and came seen. And interestingly enough, when he came back seen, the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, verse 8, that he was blind, said, It is not this he that sat and begged? Someone, someone said, well, this is he. Others said, mm, he is like him, but he said, I am he. So people were like confounded. They couldn't understand. Like, this is, is this the guy? Is this the person that we used to beg and was blind? And, and they would say, no, it can't be, really. He maybe looks like him. But he would say, no, I am him. I am that person. I am he. Then they asked him, well, how were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, where is he? And he said, I know not. I don't know where Jesus is. All I know that this man came, named Jesus, put clay on my eyes, told me to go to that Siloam, uh, pool of Siloam and then wash. But they, they could not understand. They're like, this is something, I mean, this is, and, and it was on the Sabbath. So they brought him, verse 13, to the Pharisees. And uh, that him that after, after time, uh, aforetime time, was blind. And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made them clay and opened his eyes. So verse 15, then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received the sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon my eyes and I wash and do see. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, he, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. So they said unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him that he had opened the eyes? He said, he's a prophet. So they're arguing, they don't understand, and they are trying to say that Jesus is a, is, is, is a sinner, that, is in, that he cannot do these works um, in the Sabbath because that's transgression. And then at the same time, others saying, well, but how can he do that? They're discussing. So they said, let's ask this man. And the man says, well, I believe he's a prophet. And as he's hearing them, this, they said to him, uh, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received the sight. So they, they just did not want to believe. It's like even though they were seeing these men watching and, 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 and blind and that had been given the eyesight, they still did not believe in him. And so they asked his parents. And you know the story, they, they asked the parents, and the parents say, look, we don't want to get involved in this situation. Just ask him. So when they come back to him and ask him, notice how this man starts truly opening his eyes. Then again, verse 24, called the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. Now, this expression is, is a little not correct. If you, if you actually have the King James Version, you see that this word or no is, is italics. It's not, in, it's not really in the, in the original and it's because he should read this way. This blind man said, whether he be a sinner, I know not. In other words, I do not see Jesus as a sinner. To me, he is not a one. I do not have knowledge of him transgressing. I don't see him as a sinner. I don't think that he's a sinner. One thing I know is that I was blind, and now I see. Then said they to him, What did he do to thee? How opened him thy eyes? And he answered them and said, Have I told you? I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore, will you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Do you want to join and follow this man? Are you trying to be convinced by the evidences of this man's actions? This man, this man was opening his eyes to the fact that he was able to see that this man, Christ, was a Messiah, that he was a man beyond our, 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 our understanding. Verse 39, <clears throat> verse 28, 
Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses, and for this fellow we know not from whence he is. And notice his response. The men answered and said to them, Why herein is a marvelous thing? What a wonderful thing, he says to them. <laughs> that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he had opened my eyes. Here this man is being put in a sense in a trial among men and he's starting to realize that these people, these religious leaders, had no knowledge of who Christ was and yet he, all it took for him was to have a miracle happen in his life to realize that this man was truly the God sent Messiah. That he truly was something that will save him from his sins. Now we know, verse 31, that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was not a heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and thou teach us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Thou thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and in, it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe and worship him. In this beautiful experience of this man, was this man truly alone when he was going through this trial, the trial of his life, having to defend his experience with Jesus, having to defend his encounter with Christ? The religious leaders of the time, those that were supposed to help this man and embrace him and, and, and accept him and rejoice with this man, would cast him out because they did not want to be or see a man who was transformed, who was renewed, who was changed, who his character had been transformed by the touch of Christ. They did not want to see that. And so this man, while he was going through that trial, he was going through that tribulation of being persecuted for his encounter with Christ. Christ was, like Job said, even though he was not, he could not see Jesus, Jesus was there with him. Even though he could not feel him, Christ was there with him and seen everything that this man was going through. And at the end, when this man is rejected and he feels that he's alone, in that moment of despair, Christ comes to him and tells him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he says, Lord, who is it that I may believe him? He says, the one that speaketh to you. That's, that's him. And what, he, what does he do? What, what does this man do? What is his response to this experience with Christ? I believe, and he worshipped him. And look what Christ said at the end, verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world. For what? For judgment. The mystery of the judgment it is a true fact. Christ da did come to finish that work of redemption. He came to, as, as first as a lamb to sacrifice himself for us, but now he's in the most holy place interceding for us because he did come for judgment. And he came to this world for judgment that they which see not might see. Those that are not able to see Christ but want to have an encounter with Christ. Just like Job who did not see God, but they, he, he, he felt that in spite of what everything around him was telling him, he could by faith embrace God and his father and his, and his son. And so the same way this man is able to en en embrace Christ and Christ is saying, that is the purpose of judgment. That those that were blind can now see and sadly, they that which were, and, and they that which see might be made blind. Just like we saw in the parable of the marriage in Matthew 22. 
God, those that reject the opportunity, those that reject his garment, his righteousness, Christ's righteousness, to those, the judgment is worrisome. To those, the judgment, it is something to be fearful. But when you come to Christ and you realize in yourself there's nothing you can do but only Christ, you can, by grace and by faith, that the judgment is for our redemption, is for our salvation. And so the question is, though, and in this verse, look back in, in, John, in, Luke, uh, in John 9, Christ speaks of judgment in present. He's never speaking of it in future. He's never speaking of it in the past. He's always speaking in present, in the present tense. Because it is, for us, is it really important to know when the process changes from death to living? Does it really make a difference? It shouldn't. Because for us, we have to understand that it is today, now. And like I was mentioning in the beginning, some of the misconceptions that we think is that somehow when my name comes up, I will, God will have five minutes or to examine my life in a very short moment and make a decision and that'll be it. But truly, as we have seen in the story of Job and we have, and see how Christ acts, he can, we can see that the judgment is it's something that Christ really sees us through. And until he's interceding, he is judging, acting, present. He is looking over the lives, just like he looked at the life of Job time and time again. And he, he saw and he, and he spent time sh- seeing through his life to see how he was doing. Of course, we have to understand that for us, as the people of God, the judgment ends in two ways, only two ways. For us, the moment you die, the judgment is, is for you over. Isn't it? Would you agree with that? It's correct. So, do you have guarantees of tomorrow? Does anybody here can say, tomorrow I have life? Absolutely not. So yes, that is why it's so important. Uh, over and over in the scriptures, we see the urgency of today. Never tomorrow, but today. Today, if you hear his voice, today, choose today who you will serve. The message of the mystic judgment is always about today. You need to make your life hidden. You have to hide your life in Christ today. So the judgment ends for us, either at death or at the appointed time of close approbation. That is a fact. But while we are in the judgment, if your name, and again, this is an if, because there is no in script prophecy, and you can try to find it, uh, and you can search it yourselves, but there's no real marked point of, of exchange or process that I've seen in scripture, and I don't see it anywhere, and I believe, I believe it's, it's not revealed to us. But nowhere does it say when we start, when this thing switches, changes. And the reason is because we have to understand that it could be even now. That's as simple as we should think. We should think maybe it's happening now. Maybe it's happening now. But while the Christ is interceding, as he said, while there is, I am the light, while I'm in the world, while I am still interceding, there is still light. There is still grace. So while he's interceding, and until we do not see the close of probation ending, we cannot pass judgment on anyone. I don't care how terrible that person is or how bad uh, a human or an Adventist person might be, it's still up to the Lord to decide. And we need to do our part in what sense? Today, prepare myself every single day. It could be my last day. It could be my last day of judgment. So by thinking this way, by analyzing our lives at, at this light, to me, this promise of Christ that he made to this blind man, this promise that he says, for the judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they, that which, might s- and they which see might be made blind. 
And some of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have not, no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. How hard will it be for us who have been privileged to know beyond measure the knowledge of the times, the knowledge of the truths. We as a church, we as people, we individually have been blessed to understand the times in which we live. We're living in the Day of Atonement. The professed churches of Christ in this generation are exalted to the highest privilege. The Lord has been revealed to us in ever-increasing light. Our privileges are far greater than were the privileges of God's ancient people. That which was type and symbol to the Jews is reality to us. We have the assurance of a Savior who has come, a Savior who has been crucified, who has risen, and over the rent sepulcher of Joseph has proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. In our knowledge of Christ and his love, the kingdom of God is placed in the midst of us. The spiritual banquet is set before us in rich abundance. The wedding garment, provided at infinite cost, is freely offered to every soul. By the messengers of God are presented to us the righteousness of Christ, justification by faith, the exceeding great and precious promises of God's word, free access to the Father by Christ. What could God do for us that he has not done in providing the great supper, the heavenly banquet? What hasn't God done for us? What has not God given us to have an excuse? My beloved, I pray, and I, I, I in a sense, I pray that myself and every single one of you can truly understand the urgency of giving our lives to the Lord, to yielding our will to him, to ask him to come and to take his perfect robe of righteousness so that we may be able to see indeed, so that we may be able to be taken and be transformed, be cleansed, be purified, be made whole again, just like that light man who saw Christ, that we may be able to see Christ indeed. And as we go through tribulation, maybe trials, remember, Christ is interceding. Christ is watching. Christ is there with us. Christ is, even though you may not feel or see, he is next to you. May the Lord allow us to be ready for his soon coming. The time is approaching when there will be no option, no open door. But today, Christ the Word is still the light. Today, there is still a chance. Today, we can say, Lord, Thank you for allowing me to live this life, to be alive, and to surrender myself to you. And I don't have to fear of the judgment in any way unless I'm without you, unless I have not put the wedding garment. May the Lord grant us the chance to be faithful and to stand before the throne of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am indeed grateful for your truth and for your word and for the testimony that you have given us that you can make us whole again, that you can cleanse us from all sin. And even though we may be blind and we're in sin by birth, you can actually touch our lives and cleanse us and make us whole. Your judgment is a judgment that is just and right. And you are seeing and watching over the, your people, interceding, trying to finish the work in each of our lives. Help us, Lord, to surrender ourselves to you and to be willing to be transformed by your Holy Spirit, that we may have a perfect character, spotless, just like you, because you have become in us that hope of glory. Grant us, Lord, the desire to be a mirror of your image. 
and help each of us here today and those who are watching or hearing this message as well to give ourselves wholeheartedly to you while there's still time. I pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.